This video is about the times two famous Allied pilots, Don Gentili and John Godfrey, flew together. They flew for the RAF and the U.S. Army Air Force out of Debden, England. Aside from their individual accomplishments, Gentili and Godfrey are famous for the occasions when they teamed up. Between them, they were credited with, depending on the source, 56 aircraft destroyed, 36 in the air and 20 on the ground. These 4th Fighter Group P-47s are on the way back from a bomber escort mission to Essen, Germany. This is John Godfrey's first combat mission. Godfrey served with the RAF before being assigned to the 336 Fighter Squadron of the 4th Fighter Group. Gentili is the element leader. Within the next year, Godfrey and Gentili would become renowned throughout the world as a fighter pilot duo. Gentili had become a flight leader this same September month. He normally led B flight for the 336 Fighter Squadron, and Jib Goodson, the squadron CO, led A flight. Both Gentili and Godfrey got an early start in the war as Americans who joined the Royal Canadian Air Force. They both joined separately four and three months respectively before the U.S. entered the war. Gentili had already been flying combat missions for 15 months, since June of 1942. Gentili flew with other RAF squadrons before joining 133 Squadron, one of the three RAF Eagle Squadrons, where he flew his first combat missions. The American Eagle Squadron pilots flew Spitfire Mark Vs until being absorbed into the U.S. Army Air Force in September of 1942, forming the core of the 4th Fighter Group. They kept their Spitfires with the original RAF squadron codes, but the RAF roundels were overpainted with American stars. In April of 1943, they traded the more streamlined Spitfires for bigger P-47Cs, which many of the pilots were not happy about. The Spitfires were perceived to have better maneuverability and climb rate, although the P-47s have better range, good firepower with longer firing duration, and excellent dive capability. On the way back to Debden, Gentili was low on fuel, so he left the group to look for a closer airfield. Godfrey followed. Flying through heavy cloud, Gentili descended from 26,000 feet in an unorthodox, tight spiral. They broke through the cloud layer only 1,500 feet above the ground, saw the coast, and found an airbase, Bradwell, in Essex, south of the Thames. After they landed, Gentili went over to Godfrey and praised him for staying so close on his wing. Gentili's gyro compass wasn't working, so he had no idea what direction he was flying in, not to mention where the ground was. He was grateful things didn't end badly. Later that evening in a bar, Gentili commented about how impressed he was by Godfrey. His eyesight, which might have been the best in the U.S. Army Air Force, and his ability to fly close formation. And so... Johnny Godfrey completed his first combat mission, and it just happened to be as Don Gentili's wingman. Don Blakesley, a veteran flight leader, led four sorties to Dieppe on the 19th of August, 1942, to support the British and Canadian landings. Blakesley claimed enemy aircraft destroyed with each sortie. Blakesley was another American who joined the Royal Canadian Air Force. He joined a year before Godfrey and Gentili. Blakesley transferred to 133 Eagle Squadron two months before Dieppe as a flight leader. After Dieppe, he would go on to temporarily lead the squadron.
Here landing craft are withdrawing from the beachheads in front of the town. Heinko 111s, DO 217s, JU 88s, and FW 190 fighter bombers bombed and strafed the landing craft as they withdrew from the beaches. Half of the landing craft were destroyed. Both Godfrey and Gentili had tendencies to break away from a flight and attack enemy aircraft solo early in their careers. There was a lot of competition to try to get to aircraft before somebody else could beat you to it. Gentili was the first to see the need to fly with a wingman, and he convinced Godfrey. From Don Gentili's book, One Man Air Force, I, I saw a Junkers 88 going down to lay his eggs on what was temporarily our beach. He was diving and I dove with him and under him so that he couldn't see me and I could get up to speed. Then I pulled up behind him and let him have it. I didn't take any evasive action. I felt so confident. I was packed swollen with blissful ignorance and I just threw a barn door full of bullets at him. He jettisoned his bombs in the water trying to get away, and I banged him again, and he burned on the beach. Right after that, while I was still down on the dock, crazy with confidence and a sense of power, I saw two yellow-nosed fock wolves under me, some Abbeville kids looking for a fight to get into. I got onto their tails and shot down one, but the other got away from me. From Gentili's book, John and I had been separated from the others in my flight. And suddenly, as we turned around to look for some of our boys, I spotted these two lone FW 190s cruising along. I told Godfrey, let's go jump these boys before they get away. We turned and dived on them. And as we got closer, I said to John, I'll take the one on the left, and you take the guy on the right. And that's how we clobbered them. After we parked our jugs, I asked John what he thought about his second kill, 
and he said, Perfect teamwork. I liked it. Don knew then that Johnny had seen the light about teamwork. He thought Johnny was going to be an excellent wingman, eager, alert, and a very smooth pilot. The 4th Fighter Group converted from P-47s to Mustangs in February of 1944, flying their first missions in early March. Many P-51s turned back early due to teething problems. By March, both Gentili and Godfrey were leading separate flights for the 336 Fighter Squadron, meaning they didn't fly together. They could only pair up when other flight members turned back or if they became separated from their starting wingmen during the fighting. Godfrey wrote that the P-47s he flew only had belly tanks, implying no wing tanks. The Mustangs came with wing pylons. This mission is the VKF Ball Bearing Works in Erkner. Erkner is 16 miles southeast of Berlin, so it was a long mission. Participating in that mission were 411 B-17s, 209 B-24s, and 876 escort fighters, although it seemed like the participation rate by the 4th Fighter Group was minimal due to a lot of fighters turning back. As they approached the bomber stream, Gentili and Godfrey saw a number of enemy fighters attacking the lead formation of B-17s. From the book Two-Man Air Force, Don Gentili recalled, We were flying alone, went down to break up a head-on attack on the lead box of forts. Fifty 109s were flying in twos and fours. Many 109s were in the area. We were able to pick and choose the best bounces. I picked two and we did six or seven turns with them. From the same book, Godfrey's version of the story goes, Don dived on a 109 quickly, got behind and blew him apart, knowing he was protected. Now a 109 slipped into Godfrey's ring sight. Don said they were clear and for Godfrey to nail him, which he did. The 109 flipped on its back, trailing smoke through its final plunge. Gentili continues, We attacked another 109 head-on. The gyrations this Hun was making forced me to violent action, but Johnny rode right along like a blocking back who could run with the best. Using flaps, I got behind him, close to 100 yards, got strikes, and the pilot bailed out.
The two pilots formed abreast and climbed for the fighter formation at 28,000 feet, slightly above the bomber stream. They noticed two 109s turning in to attack the B-17s and dived to shoot them. Don took the one on the left, and that burst into flames after a few seconds of attention. Don and Johnny had begun firing simultaneously. The narration from Gentili goes, Notice two 109s flying abreast and close together. Told Godfrey to take the right one. I opened fire at 250 yards and closed in until I almost rammed him. The plane went down spinning and smoking badly. Godfrey exploded his 109. Gentilly described it as Johnny and I formed up tight and went against a team of two Messerschmitts. I'll take the port one and you take the starboard one, I told Johnny, and we came in line abreast and in a two-second burst finished off both of them. They were dead before they knew we were there. Godfrey became an ace that day. Now they were flying at the same altitude as the bombers. The enemy fighters had gone, and flak bursts filled the sky in that area. From Gentili's book, he recalls, Then a Messerschmitt bounced Johnny. Johnny turned into him, and I swung around to run interference for him. The Hun made a tight swing to get on Johnny's tail. saw me and rolled right under me before I could get a shot in. I rolled with him and fastened to his tail. But by that time, we were very close to flak coming up from the city. The Hun wasn't so worried about the flak. I was his immediate, more desperate wool. Then I got strikes on him. Glycol started coming out of him and I had to pass him. But Johnny had fallen into formation right on my wing and he took up the shooting right where I had left off. He put more bullets into the Hun while I was swinging up and around to run interference for him. Godfrey's version of the events went like this. Don tried to get on the 109's tail who broke off and headed for the ground. When the 109 pulled out, I fired rounds at him. There were strikes on the fuselage and wing as we skimmed the treetops. My ammo ran out. I radioed Don to finish the 109. Gentili's story continues, Then Godfrey said his ammunition had run out, and I said, Okay, I'll finish him.
and I followed him down into the streets, clobbering him, until he pulled up and bailed out. In some of the story versions, the 109 had a belly tank that caught fire, which seems hard to believe that he would attack with the belly tank still attached. On the return trip, Don and Johnny encountered a lone B-17. One engine shut down and escorted it back to England. Gentilly summed things up for that day as, to show how a team works, even when a big brawl has broiled the team down to two men flying wing on each other, Johnny and I spent 20 minutes over Berlin on March 8th and came out of there with six planes destroyed to our credit. They shared credit for that last 109. Teamwork is the answer to any man's score. Gentilly and Godfrey agreed to fly together on future missions. The checkerboards were added to the fuselage with the intent to make it easier to keep track of each other in a dogfight. In mid-March, the 4th Fighter Group painted the noses of their Mustangs red. There's speculation that Gentilly flew through a thunderstorm and wore some of the red paint off the tip of his spinner. Then it was cleaned up by removing more red paint. On the 23rd of March, Gentilly and Godfrey teamed up again, and both claimed 109s in a dogfight near Munsta. Gentilly claimed two 109s as the element leader, and then switched positions with Godfrey, who claimed one more. On a mission to Brunswick on the 29th of March, 1944, although they didn't fly in the same flight, Godfrey may have saved Gentilly's life by warning him of two 190s coming down on his tail. News reporters were taking interest in Gentilly as he got close to tying Rickenbacker's World War I record. No one was sure if both air and ground victories should count towards that goal. The U.S. Army Air Force wanted to promote flight elements making use of wingmen. Gentilly and Godfrey became poster boys for that concept. Gentilly agreed to take time off for a four-month tour in the U.S. if he would be allowed to return to combat. Blakesley, the fourth fighter group CO since January 1st, knew this. Gentilly already had 500 hours and one extension. Before he took off that April 13th day, the reporters who would be waiting for him when he returned asked if he would fly low so they could take photos. Blakesley had a standing decree that anyone damaging an aircraft buzzing would be sent home. Gentilly had a long history of buzzing things on the ground starting during his biplane days. He once buzzed an English Greyhound racetrack as a means of getting out of being assigned to flight instructor duty. Unfortunately, his luck finally ran out. The crash was due to pilot error. At the time, Gentilly claimed 30 aircraft destroyed, 23 in the air and 7 on the ground. This was later reduced to 20.83 in the air and 6 on the ground. Bob Johnson is generally credited with being the first to beat Rickenbacker's record in the ETO. Godfrey's original VFP P-51 took a flak hit on 21 March 1944, which may have contributed to its retirement. Godfrey received a new natural metal finish P-51B in mid-April 1944. Godfrey actually borrowed Shangri-La for two missions on April 9th and 11th, just before Gentilly crashed it. Godfrey was worn out and was grounded for a few days. He didn't fly the new Mustang for a first mission until the 22nd of April, and he got three 109s with it, but was almost shot down. Godfrey had a chance to fly it again two days later, but on the 27th of April, his new Mustang was crashed by his roommate. And that was the end of that. Godfrey flew three more missions, continuing to add to his score. In early May, he was given a 30-day leave for a war bond tour of bases, where he reunited with Gentilly and other aces. After only a few weeks, Godfrey got tired of the touring and applied for and was granted a second tour of duty at Debden. He resumed flying on the 31st of July and flew several more missions during that time, adding to his score. However, the 24th of August was his last mission. While strafing an aerodrome for the third time, breaking his own rule, 
He was hit by gunfire and bellied in to become a POW with 18 air and 18 ground victories, the most 36 in the ETO at that time. From two-man Air Force, years later, while reviewing gun camera footage, it was ironically found that Godfrey's wingman had fired rounds into his aircraft by not waiting for Godfrey to clear out of the way while strafing the base. That is ironic. In a story about wingmen. When in Royal Canadian Air Force pre-flight training, Johnny learned his brother Reggie had been killed when his ship was sunk by a German U-boat. Thus, Reggie's reply. Godfrey actually paid his crew chief two pounds to paint that nose art. The fourth fighter group pilot rankings in order, assuming I haven't missed anyone, is Don Gentili, credited with 20.83 in the air. Dwayne Beeson, who had a friendly rivalry with Gentili until the 5th of April when he was hit by ground fire and bailed out, was credited with 17.33 aerial victories. Godfrey was originally credited with 18 in the air, but that was later revised to 16.33 and 14 on the ground. Don Blakesley was credited with 14 and a half aerial victories. Jim Goodson with 14. Jim was down by AA on the 14th of June, 1944. All of these guys got an early start with the Royal Canadian Air Force, and all but Godfrey were vets from the Eagle Squadrons. That's it for the two Debden teammates.